So, this is the time of the year when people embrace how horrific human imagination can be, and we are all here to perpetuate this tradition for our own amusement. As such, I've brought you a being that is quite repulsive and condemnable in many aspects, a relatively obscure entity of ghastly design, for which I probably managed to scrounge up all accessible information. This terrible monstrosity is no other than the Kokuri Baba, a Japanese yokai in the shape of an old hag. Yes, very original, I know. The name of Kokuri Baba roughly means Hag of the Old Temple Living Quarters or Hag in the House. Or at least that's what I've been told. I don't speak Japanese and machine translation gave me Old Warehouse Back Woman and Ancient Old Old, so I guess it's a toss up between those four. Now the name has quite a bit more to it, but let's take a look at what this decrepit crone is before we dive into the peripheral stuff. So, each Kokuri Baba haunts a remote temple, generally on mountain ranges, inhabiting the living quarters of these religious buildings. Which is not unexpected since they technically owned the place before, well, turning into a cannibalistic monster. These hags were once mortal women, wives or lovers of the priests running the aforementioned places of worship. The thing is that these were Buddhist priests. Even though many sects today allow such relationships, those were quite the taboo back in the day. You know, because it is very easy for human beings to deny the laws of nature themselves and resist the longing to form close bonds and intimate connections with others they find attractive because love is a choice. It's not like we have innumerable examples when pent-up sexual frustrations burst out as something nasty or even harmful for both affected individuals and society as a whole. Anyway, these forbidden vibes were shunned by the general public, and as such, horrific tales were spun to add some spice to something so scandalous as two people loving each other. To be fair, the tales we have of these women start off quite flatteringly. They are always very supportive, maintaining the temple and helping out with parishioners. Loving and faithful, their life revolves around their duties and husband, but it all goes downhill once they lose their significant other, and it's quite a steep slope. They become closed in, barely leaving their room, let alone the building. As such, supplies start running out, and they have to look for other ways to sustain themselves. Fortunately for the Kokuri Baba, it is customary to leave rice offerings at Buddhist temples. However, it is also a terrible sin to steal those. As a punishment, these mourning widows are no longer able to die, transforming into a yokai instead of passing on to the next life. A yokai with a taste for human flesh. Kind of a dick way to punish someone. For the fact that she committed a lesser evil, the Kokuri Baba now has to do something a lot more messed up and cause a lot more suffering. Justice, am I right? So, these temples are used for funerary services, which means a lot of poorly attended dead bodies left lying around. These constitute the primary source of nutrition for the Baba, as she carves them up and nibbles on the slices. That being said, these yokai don't have a distaste for fresh flesh either. Solitary visitors to these temples may wound up as charcuterie, as they usually don't realize the danger until it is too late, which either means that these crones do not look too out of the ordinary, or these people had it coming in the first place, trusting a shriveled creature within a temple where, for some reason, most of the graves have been exhumed. Oh yes, Kokuri Baba do not restrict themselves to the recently deceased. If the steady supply of corpses dries up, they dig up what they can. The legends generally mention rotting flesh, but considering the fact that each new arrival ends up in a stew rather than a grave, it is safe to assume they won't find much sustenance underground. That being said, this is not a constant feature. Beside a lovely meal, dead bodies also offer her a different resource. Hair. Indeed, in a lot of the images, the Kokuri Baba is shown using the hair of the deceased to weave some clothes for herself. It probably makes for pretty subpar clothing, but it's not like she has a lot of other options. Other notable recurring elements in terms of artistic depictions include a rather sickly looking cat. None of the sources I found mentioned anything about the cat beyond the fact that it is on the image. It is a distinct possibility that the cat is simply a product of faithfully copying the original artwork. It may also play a role in the source used for the book the Kokuri Baba was first mentioned in. Well, 
the name at least. Toriyama Sekien more or less made up this particular yokai for his third book in a four-part series all about monsters and supernatural beings. The supplement to the 100 demons from the present and the past was published in 1781 and together with its prequels and sequel formed the basis for most of today's yokai depictions. Indeed, this is the very image that has been copied ever since. Most are quite faithful, some take a few liberties, and others are a lot more contemporary Japanese. I wonder what parts of a deceased person those are. Anyway, this is apparently the first actual place where the Kokori Baba is mentioned as such, with nothing more than a few lines. These few lines are a translation of Sekien's original text, clearly referencing the Chuo Gang Lu as the source for this entity. According to Japan Demonium Illustrated, this source is a much older 14th century book titled Tales Told While Resting from Farm Work. It was written by the Chinese Tao Zongyi. The story is filed under the section on cannibalism, mentioning the man-eating crone that was the wife of a Buddhist priest. As for whether Sekien can be viewed as the inventor of the Baba or not, is a difficult question. Even if his version is technically an adaptation, it has taken a life of its own. A marginally less obscure one at that. Looking back at the brief entry that introduced this flavor of corpse muncher to the world, Sekia made sure to denote that the Kokori Baba is even more fearsome than the Datsubepa, which is highly debatable. Let's analyze this as objectively as we can. So, on the one hand, we have the reclusive woman turned cannibal that occasionally kills people and mutilates corpses. On the other hand, we have a thoroughly dickish old bitch. Datsubeba roughly translates to old woman who strips clothes and is plying her terrible trade at the Sansu River, which is a bit like the Buddhist sticks. She terrorizes two particular groups of the deceased. The first are children. Since they have not had enough time to accumulate the experiences that would form their character, these souls have trouble crossing the otherworldly river. On its banks, they are approached by Datsubeba with a shit-eating grin. She makes them strip, the absolute creep, then instructs them to amass a high pile of pebbles on which they can climb to paradise. Then her and her demon buddies go around knocking down each pile of significant height for shits and giggles. I have no idea why she is permitted to do that, but uh, someone else has to periodically rescue these souls trapped in perpetual pebble piling. Jizo, the Bodhisattva, comes around every once in a while and in order to be able to take the victims across the river, he hides the naked children in his robe. Mm. Anyway, that's not where Datsubeba's antics end. She also strips adults of their clothes, but she actually has a reason for that. The garments are hung onto the branch of a riverside tree by Old Man Kaneo, an Oni who judges the weight of the sins the deceased has committed based on how much the branch bends. If you happen to die naked, don't worry, Datsubeba has a tried and tested solution. She rips off your skin. While this is technically very early in the journey to the afterlife, some punishments are still administered here and Datsubeba is there to get her hands dirty. For example, if you happen to have stolen anything in your life, she will break your fingers and tie your head to your feet. <sighs> I love the smell of moral absolutism in the morning. Nothing better than disregarding all form of context and having a blanket punishment for a very broad type of crime. Putting sarcasm aside for a second, context is the very thing that makes the Datsubeba a much worse thing than the Kokuri Babas, who are victims of circumstance, turned monster by the messed up laws of the world, according to the lore. This bitch enjoys being a dick, and even if she technically does not kill, she does try to torment the souls of children for eternity, so there's that. But I digress. There is one more thing about the Kokori Baba that I promised I'd touch on. It has to do with the name and how Sekian loved to play with words. Kokori is also used in the folk phrase, 
Bukuri Kokuri. It is simply used to refer to something frightening, especially by parents trying to scold their children. However, Mukuri Kokuri has a very fascinating historical origin as well. During the Mongol invasion of the 13th century, Japanese people viewed the invaders as actual demons. Due not in small part to their aggressive approach to warfare as well as their more advanced technology. The origin of this expression can be traced back to the phrase Moko Kokuri no Onigakuru which means the Mongolian Korean demons are coming. The passage of time chiseled it down to only the second word and the corruption of the first one, losing much of its edge in the process. It does also create a minor link between foreigners and the Kokuri Baba, but it is coincidental at best. So that's pretty much all the information on these Babas. But here's the thing. I'm the realism guy, the weird rooster dragon snake of front nature who always tries to create believable versions of the monsters featured in his videos. What am I going to do with a desiccated supernatural hack that likes to nibble on long pig? Well, I could take a closer look and see if something so horrific has a chance to occur and how close such an event could be to the lore. Naturally, I will disregard religious elements and supernatural powers not trying to disrespect anyone's faith, but, you know, people turning into immortal monsters for committing sacrilege is not exactly a documented phenomenon. First off, is there any real-life connection we can make? Are there any reports or mentioned locations? Well, apparently the book titled Library of Monsters 2 Nurarihion mentions a Kokuri Baba, or at least a very similar corpse-eating woman. This is the only source that mentions a location beyond the vague mountain temples, and it states that the creature was encountered between Nara and Osaka. It's not a lot of information, covering about 20 kilometers of space, so there's nothing I could gather from this alone. We'll have to go solely off of the lore. It starts simple enough. A Buddhist priest taking a wife and dying before her is well within the realms of possibility. Her becoming reclusive, abandoning her duties is also a potential prospect. However, it is odd that no new priest is sent to take the place of the old one that passed. I'm not intimately familiar with how exactly successors are appointed, but I would assume it is in the interest of everyone to fill the gap, especially if the temple sees active use, which seems to be the case in these stories. I'd normally say that her taking over for at least a little while is a possibility, but since the lore states she barely leaves the living quarters, this is not exactly an option. Considering that replacement may take quite a bit of time, especially if her travels slowly, her having the opportunity to steal some rice offerings is not a stretch. What is a stretch is that in the stories she remains unattended until and beyond her transformation. Now, as I said, I'm not going to make up some bullshit disease or introduce a magic system to try and rationalize her turning into yokai. However, that changes little on the fact that she is supposed to be alone in the temple until she would normally die, according to the lore, or get hungry enough to pop open a corpse, which would be the plausible version. The sequence of events mandates that funerals are still held at the temple, even though the priest is dead. As far as I know, Buddhist funerals require an officiant who leads the sermon. I'd struggle to imagine a scenario where people carry their dead relative to a temple, place them somewhere convenient, say their prayers and whatnot, then leave and hope someone will bury the rotting carcass they left there. Well, there is the option that any new monk or priest they send there gets killed by the now completely psychopathic woman. It is reinforced by the part of the legends where she kills religious figures who pass by. She could potentially lie to visitors about where the newcomer is and keep the facade up to a point. It does get very suspicious after a while, but perhaps that's not a problem. In a scenario where the Kokuri Baba is based on a real person, it would be evident that she gets discovered at some point. If her husband died of old age, she might very well be old enough to resemble the heck too. It is also not impossible that the new priest of the temple lets her stay there, and she steals dead flesh and exhumes graves in secret until found out. That being said, these do kind of require her to go clinically insane in a short period of time. 
It is quite a leap to go from mourning your husband to slicing up bodies, especially since the legends suggest she is eating them raw, rotten even. Now, contrary to popular belief, cannibalism does not inherently infect people with diseases like the Kuru. Illnesses that are caused by prions, which are incorrectly folded proteins, are more easily transmitted this way, but these are relatively rare, posing a minor threat at most. If she makes sure to get the missing nutrients from other sources, like the offering rice, she could technically remain healthy. Eating it raw or out of the grave does kind of ruin that though, as there is no cleansing heat that would kill the potential pathogens living there. So doing this is not sustainable long term, that is for sure, both in terms of getting found out and just rather rapidly offing themselves as they cosplay a human petri dish. Therefore, even if we assume the Kokuri Baba had some mental issues prior to her husband dying, and the decay of her psyche is simply hastened by the tragedy, we are looking at a couple body rates at best. The legend states that she's been doing this for 7 generations, which would be around 200 years. Yeah, anyway we look at it, that's an exaggeration at best in this case. That being said, I'd very much assume a single instance would be enough to generate the legends themselves. In reality, the very fact that these women were married to priests was enough for malicious people to spin horrific tales about them. Therefore, we don't technically need her to rack up any significant kill count, slice up droves of unattended dead, or plow through the graves for a few putrid morsels. No, we can make a relatively lawful recreation and let gossip and time do the rest. Some form of mental illness, like dementia or Alzheimer's, is a bit of a prerequisite, which, paired with the immense grief caused by losing potentially the only person close to them, could lead to a rapid decline. Replacing the priest would more than likely take quite a bit of time, and as I've said, it is well within the realm of possibilities the video would intentionally or unintentionally eat the rice offerings. This is the point where the gossips start spreading, as it would be considered a heinous crime. Funeral services would likely not resume until the newcomer arrives, but it would not be implausible that the freshman priest lets her stay. It could be out of pity, it could be he expects her to earn her keep. Either way, mental deterioration paired with dead bodies left at the same place she used to find her food I can certainly see some gruesome events without any contrivance. The exhumation of graves is likewise something not too far-fetched, especially since her husband would almost definitely be buried in the local cemetery. Desperation and confusion could lead her to start clawing at the dirt, which alone is munition enough for yokai tales. Why the murder element is not a necessity? A highly unstable old lady vilified by the visitors, as well as the priest, who by now lightly detests and fears her, is a rather volatile situation. Frustration can make dementia and Alzheimer's patients quite aggressive and violent. It takes but one inopportune outburst, and the two capable of causing lethal damage, like a knife. While the lore adds some rather colorful exaggerations and presents a rather clear-cut story, foregoing the fantastical elements and adding a bit of nuance can make it a realistic collection of events. Since these would take place at a time when belief in the supernatural was strong, no wonder people would think of the old lady as a yokai. She is a victim of circumstance, with barely any agency over her actions. Therefore it is difficult to blame her for any of it, but it is a terrifying tragedy nonetheless. There you go, instead of an animal I grounded the lore as much as possible. Was it as entertaining? I hope so, but it's the Halloween special anyway, so you already skipped forward 